Good evening, everyone. Some of you will still be joining us, but we have a lot to do tonight, so we're going to get started. My name is Charlene Margot, and I am co-founder of Nonprofit The Parent Venture. We are absolutely delighted to be with you tonight. Um, we have with us Allison Lanier, Associate Superintendent of Educational Services, and our keynote presenter, Eduardo Briseño. Uh, we want to start out by thanking the Cupertino Union School District for this event as well as our main sponsor, the Cupertino Educational Endowment Foundation. I'm now going to hand it over to Allison Lanier, again, Associate Superintendent, for a few opening remarks. Allison. Good evening, everyone. I'm so happy to see that we have such a large participant audience signed up tonight. We have parents here as well as lots of educators from our district. I'm just really excited to be able to bring this topic for conversation and discussion and thought partnership. Um, in our district, we have a strategic plan in place. And one of the core commitments of that strategic plan is helping our kids get that sense of being a capable and confident learner as they're going through our district and, and into high school. We want the kids to be able to feel that they can tackle their coursework and also go after their passions and dreams as they enter into high school. And um, we also know that their ability to do that is um, shaped by how they see themselves as learners and also by the learning environments and experiences that we offer to them at school, but also um, at home. So um, we're very excited to have this opportunity to learn more about this topic of growth mindset and think about how we can do that together. We are taking a look at how the kids are seeing themselves in this area through our panorama survey, which is a, a survey that we give to the kids um, in grades three through eight. And growth mindset is an area there that um, we're taking a look at. And we can see that we have some great strengths that students are reporting in that area and also some areas for growth. Their results as a group are right about average when we look at um, the percentile across all of the million or so kids taking the survey in our nation. So that tells us again, lots of strengths and also some room for growth. So our sites have been doing some great thinking about this and uh, we're excited to dive in to this topic tonight. Thank you everybody for being here and thank you again to CIF, our partner um, who makes these events possible. Thank you, Charlene. Thank you so much, Superintendent Lanier. Again, my name is Charlene Margo. I am co-founder of Nonprofit The Parent Venture. We are partnering this year with Cupertino Union School District and we could not be more delighted to have with us Eduardo Briseño. The topic of tonight's talk is growth mindset for a complex and fast changing world. And as Allison said, this has been a focus for your district. So we're very pleased to bring you this talk. Um, Eduardo will be speaking for about 45 minutes, but we really also want to hear from you, the audience. He has some interactive pieces to the program tonight, so do look forward to that. There will also be time for some questions and answers, so be thinking about any questions as he is speaking. Most of you are familiar now with the webinar format on Zoom, so if you have comments, you can put them in the chat but the questions will be coming through Eduardo's interface tonight. So again, if you um, please do check the chat, my co-founder Bev Hartman will be putting resource links in there and question and answer, I think is gonna be taken care of with um, Mr. Bisseno's presentation. At the very end, there will be a very short survey. We hope you'll take a minute or so to complete that. All right, and tonight's event is being recorded and will be available on our video library. So if you're not able to attend live or you know someone who would like to watch the video, it will be available soon. All right, let me tell you a little bit about tonight's featured keynote presenter. Eduardo Briseño is a global keynote speaker, facilitator, and educator, supporting leaders who develop growth mindset cultures. He was previously the CEO of Mindset Works. Uh, the pioneer in growth mindset development services, which he co-founded in 2007 with Stanford professor Carol Dweck and Lisa Blackwell. Eduardo's TEDx talk on growth mindset and TED talk on the learning zone and the performance zone have each been viewed by millions of people. He is a Pahara Aspen fellow, a member of the Aspen Institute's Global Leadership Network and an inductee in the Happiness Hall of Fame. 
Eduardo grew up in Caracas, Venezuela, and he holds bachelor's degrees in economics and engineering from the University of Pennsylvania, as well as an MBA and master's in education from Stanford University. Most importantly, he continues to enjoy lifelong learning every day. Please join me in a really warm virtual welcome for tonight's presenter, Eduardo Briseño. Eduardo, please take it away. Thank you so much, Charlene. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. I uh, very much look forward to our exploration of growth mindset today. Uh, as, as Charlene said, we'll do some live polling as the session progresses. So have your mobile devices or any device available. And we'll also do a Q&A, which I look forward to. Um, so we, we all know that we live in a complex and fast changing world. We've been reminded of that very much over the last two years of a lot of change in the pandemic. And sometimes that might give us the impression that after the pandemic, things will go back to normal. But of course, change will always happen, right? Change has always happened. The rate of change has only accelerated. And so I'm interested in how can we prepare ourselves and our children to thrive in a complex and fast changing world, right? To be very adaptable, uh, to leverage change so that it makes us stronger and most important to drive change and to affect the change that we want to see in the world. So that's what we're going to be exploring today. Um, our goal for our time together is to advance our ability to prepare our children for a complex and fast changing world. We'll do that by examining growth mindset, what it is and why it's important. Examining how growth and learning happens, hopefully generating some insights on that. And then always identifying what, what are ways that we can take action as humans and as parents. Uh, so let's start with three questions that I'm going to ask you through polling. So I'm going to ask you to take out your mobile devices or you know, your computer is fine. Any browser, just open up a browser and navigate to this URL. And you'll see a question there that I want you to answer. And the benefit of using this polling system is that it forces us to think, reflect, to write down what we think and to share our thinking with each other. That generates deeper learning. It generates better insights. And we also, it generates learning from one another. So I learn from your thinking. I, my, what I say is informed by what you say. Um, and we're having a conversation that way with everybody involved. So the question is, how do I want my children to perceive me and to think of me? And the URL uh, you can see again here at the top is paulev.com slash works. How do I want my children to perceive me and to think of me? as caring, as a friend, as a compassionate, loving and supportive parent, as kind. As loving, as a role model, as someone who takes on challenges, puts hard work and becomes successful, as supportive and guiding, trustable, As kind and inspiring. Great. We're going to come back to this and look at it from a different lens as we move forward. So keep your devices available. We're going to be using this throughout our session. A supportive, hardworking, kind, integrity, loving, great. So two other questions before we get started with the content. Uh, the second question is, how familiar am I with Carol Dweck's the concept of growth mindset. I want to get a sense of uh, your level of familiarity with the topic that we're, we will explore. So we see there's, there's a wide range from very familiar, a quarter of you, to 35% uh, of you never heard of it. And that's exciting to me to introduce this to the third of you who've never heard of it. And my hope is that we will all continue to deepen our understanding, even for those of you who are very familiar with it. Great. And the third question before we get into the content is what might growth mindset mean, whether you're very familiar with it or you've never heard of it. If you've never heard of it, I just want you to take a wild guess. You know, what might it mean? As a quick learner, open minded, no idea, the power of yet. Continuous learning, take on challenges. 
the power of yet, willing to try, not afraid to learn something new, open to challenge, open-minded, open to learning, willing to fail, exploratory, be able to find something positive, even in an adverse situation. Anyone can learn and grow. Great. So we see a lot of uh, persistent. So we see a lot of things that are related and that are related to growth mindset. But a lot of these things are not actually growth mindset. A couple of them are. But I want to be clear about what I mean by growth mindset and what has been researched as growth mindset. Because uh, it's really important to be clear about what it is. So often we hear that growth mindset is being open-minded or you know, working hard or persevering. And none of these things are a growth mindset. A growth mindset is a perspective about the nature of human beings. None of these things are a perspective about the nature of human beings. Specifically, is when we see ourselves and others as able to change. When we see our abilities and our qualities as malleable, as changeable, as things that we can develop over time. So it's about how we see humans, how we see ourselves and others. And the reason that this belief at the bottom is really important is that what research shows is that this belief is necessary for the behaviors to take place. And so if we equate growth mindset with persistence, for example, or being open-minded, if we see somebody who's not being persistent, then we tend to just encourage them to be persistent. You know, persistence is really important and we need to be persistent for these reasons. And that, that's not a bad thing to do, but we're not, by doing that, we're not changing their mindset. We're not changing their perspective about the nature of human beings. And what, what research has shown is that it's really important for us to work at both levels, at the belief, you know, the nature of human beings, are, people can change, and also at the behaviors, okay? So a growth mindset, for example, is the belief that anybody can become smarter. That's a growth mindset about intelligence versus people are you know, have a certain level of intelligence and that doesn't change. That's a fixed mindset about intelligence. Or if we think that people are either natural leaders or they're not, and that's what determines leadership capability and capacity, that's a fixed mindset about leadership versus anybody can continue to become a better leader. That would be a growth mindset about leadership, right? Or if we think that some people are empathetic and others are not, that's a fixed mindset about empathy versus anybody can continue to become more empathetic, including ourselves. That's a growth mindset about empathy. And one reason that this is important is that if we are to improve, we have to change. Uh, sometimes we like the idea of improvement. We want to get better, but we don't like the idea of changing ourselves very much, right? And the, the, the reality is that if we haven't changed, if we're the same today than we were last week or last month, we haven't gotten better. In fact, we've probably gotten a little bit less effective because the world has changed and we haven't. So the more that we understand that we can change ourselves, the more that improvement is possible. The other reason that this is important is that lots of research has shown that this belief leads us to behave differently and therefore to achieve different results. And I'm going to briefly share with you some key takeaways from some of that research in a couple of minutes. And then we're going to reflect on when each of us is in a fixed mindset, because a fixed mindset is part of being human. We are all in a fixed mindset some of the time about certain things. And so I hope that in this session, we'll all continue to increase our self-awareness about when we're in a fixed mindset. And we, if we haven't identified that, then we just haven't reflected long enough. Uh, but right now, we're going to do the opposite. So imagine that a fixed mindset didn't exist. And imagine that we could change ourselves in whatever way we want it. If we take that as an assumption, if I could get better at anything, what would I improve, whether personal or professional? What would you improve if you could change anything, if you could improve anything about yourself? Time management. Being more patient. Being not so worried about what other people think. Listening, empathy, communications, patience, planning. Great. One thing that I want you to think about as you see what other people are submitting is of these things, which things do you tend to see as fixed in people in your everyday life as you go about work or life? What do you tend to assume people either have or don't have rather than things that people develop over time? That helps us foster, that, that helps us increase our self-awareness about our fixed mindsets, listening to others, empathy, reading more, being more accepting of others, motivation, taking more risks. Great. We'll come back to this from a different lens later in our session. 
Thank you. Um, so I want to share with you a couple of examples of people who tend to model a growth mindset, right? Uh, so one of them is J.K. Rowling, who uh, authored the Harry, Bo Harry Potter book series, which I love. is so creative. There's so much magic in it. And th the question is, like, what does she think about creativity and creative writing, right? Does, does, does she think she's a genius at that or is that something that she works to improve in herself? So she says, you have to resign yourself to wasting lots of trees before you write anything really good. That's just how it is. It's like learning an instrument. Oprah, who's one of the most successful media entrepreneurs of all time, what does she think? She says, learn from every mistake because every experience, encounter, and particularly your mistakes are there to teach you. Jeff Bezos, who led Amazon for a very long time, I think Amazon is a great uh, creator of change and driver of change, whether you think that change is good or bad, they've been really good at, at affecting the change they want to see in the world, right? So he says, people who are right a lot, they listen a lot. And anybody who doesn't change their mind a lot is dramatically underestimating the complexity of the world that we live in. And what does the Dalai Lama think about the nature of happiness? He says, Happiness is not something ready-made. It comes from your own actions. So these people share a perspective that they can change and improve themselves over time, right? Uh, and that leads them to behave differently and then to become really, really good and experienced at what they do. Uh, so I want to share a couple of things that have been shown in research about this relationship. I'm going to do that by first sharing a set of research studies so that you get a sense of how some of this research is done. And then I'm going to summarize lots of other research. So in this particular set of research studies, researchers wanted to know how people viewed intelligence, whether they viewed it like Albert Einstein did, who said, it's not that I am so smart, it's just that I stay with the problem longer, or I have no special talent, I'm only passionately curious. So he thought his ability to think and to solve problems was a result of his process and something he could develop, or whether they saw it as something that's fixed in people that the people either have or don't have. So they, they ask people to fill out a survey with questions like this one. People can learn new things, but they can't really change their basic intelligence. And so if people agreed with this, for example, that would be an indication of a fixed mindset, right? Um, and then they put these people in a brain scan machine because they wanted to know whether these people's brains work differently, where they thought they could become smarter or not. And in fact, they did work differently. So the people in a fixed mindset who thought intelligence was fixed in people, their brain was most active. It had the most blood, most blood flow and electrical activity. When they were getting information about what, whether they got things right or wrong, kind of how well they performed, right? Did I get this right? Did I get this right? Did I get this right? It's almost like they were asking themselves, how smart am I? How smart am I? How smart am I? But the people who thought they could become smarter, they were paying attention to that too but they were paying even more attention at a different time. And it was a time when the people in the fixed mindset's brains was not paying attention at all. It was very dormant. And that is when they were getting information about what they did wrong, what mistakes they made. And from that, they learned and they became more effective in solving the subsequent problems. So they became better problem solvers because they paid attention to their mistakes and they thought about it, right? They reflected on it. And they did that because they thought they could become smarter. So that's just one example of a lot of like hundreds of research studies. To summarize them, in a fixed mindset, we're thinking, okay, if people are either smart and talented or not, I want to be in the smart and talented category, right? So the way I go about doing that is doing the things that I'm already good at, that I'm very comfortable with, that I can do quickly without mistakes and without effort. I stay within my comfort zone versus in a growth mindset, we can be bored if we are not being challenged. What we want is to take on challenges, do things we haven't done before so that we can learn and grow from that. And sometimes, you know, students and children sometimes can be very disengaged and look unmotivated. And we might kind of think that they're in a fixed mindset when in fact, that's not the case. In fact, the case might be that they might not be challenged. Um, and because in a growth mindset, if we're not being challenged, we're really bored, right? Uh, in a fixed mindset, we view effort as something that's negative. Only people with low ability need to work hard. People with high ability don't need to work hard. So when we need to work hard, it makes us feel badly about ourselves. Versus in a growth mindset, we understand that the, the greatest performers and the most ex expert people in the world, they work really hard to get there and continue to work really hard to get even better. Like, like Olympic gold medalists, right? They're the best in the world and they continue to strive to get even better. That's a growth mindset. When we experience setbacks like mistakes or failure, 
in a fixed mindset, we take that as evidence that our ability is fixed at a low level. So we tend to give up. We say, okay, I'm not good at this. Let me try something else to see what I am good at, right? Versus in a growth mindset, we understand that if we're doing something we haven't mastered yet, we're not going to do it flawlessly. So we're going to try different strategies. We're going to persevere. We're going to ask for help. In a fixed mindset, when we receive feedback or criticism, we tend to react in a defensive way. We say, this person doesn't know what they're talking about, or you know, they're just trying to hurt me. Versus in a growth mindset, we listen and we ask ourselves, is there some truth here that I can learn from? And when other people succeed above our levels, in a fixed mindset, we see that as a threat. It makes us feel incompetent. Versus in a growth mindset, we observe them, we say, wow, this person is so good at what they do. What could I learn from them? What could I emulate? And all of these things enable us to be more effective learners, to grow our performance over time and to achieve higher results. And there's lots of research in lots of domains uh, that show that. But there's also research that shows that a growth mindset impacts our relationships. And we can imagine that how we view somebody who is a high performer affects how we communicate with them, how we interact with them, and therefore our relationship with them. Another example is when there's wrongdoing. Like say there's somebody who says something passive aggressive, right? Then if we're in a fixed mindset, we attribute the negative behavior to fixed traits in the other person. We label them, right? And as a result of that, we tend to react by engaging in warfare, trying to beat them down, right? Engaging in a, in a conflict uh, that is not very productive. Versus in a growth mindset, we attribute the negative behavior to things that can change in the other person, like their current understanding, their motivations, their situation. And so we tend to engage in conversation, right? Sharing our perspective, listening to theirs, being more open to mutual influence. And finally, when life gets really hard, we see higher rates of depression in a fixed mindset and lower resilience and lower rates of, uh, of, of depression and anxiety in a growth mindset and higher resilience, because we understand that we can change, the people around us can change, and the situation can change. There's a lot, of, a lot of information here. You don't have to remember it all. The key here is that when we understand that people can change, that we can change and that others can change, we become more effective learners, we achieve higher performance, and we have more positive relationships with the people around us. And sometimes when, when we learn about mindset, we tend to think about, oh, this person in my life tends to be in a fixed mindset. How do I change them? Uh, but what I encourage you to really reflect on is when am I in a fixed mindset on that left-hand column, right? We, we're trying to increase our self-awareness and that's a very important uh, early step in this process. So one question that we often get asked is, can you be in a growth mindset about something and in a fixed mindset about something else? And the answer is yes. So we might see our ability to work with numbers as something that can be developed and everybody can improve and the growth mindset. And at the same time, we might see creativity as something that's fixed in people. Some people are creative and other people are not, right? And we can hold both of those beliefs at the same time. And these beliefs can also change. Like we might go to a creativity workshop or a design thinking workshop where we experience a process through which we can be more creative and become more creative. And we can say, wow, I could actually learn how to be more creative. And that can shift our mindset about creativity. So one very effective way to foster a growth mindset is to learn effective strategies to develop that skill. So I want you to think about you know, what skills or qualities in your personal or professional life do you tend to see in a fixed mindset? And the other thing to note is that our mindset about ourselves can be different than our mindset about others. So we might see, for example, ourselves as a learner and then label other people in fixed ways, uh, our colleagues or our family members. And then if we label other people in fixed ways and we see them as people who can't change, then we're not going to share constructive information that they can learn from. And that's going to create a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Because they won't know what the problem is. They won't know there is a problem. And then they won't change as a result of that. So a fixed mindset creates self-fulfilling prophecies, whether we're thinking about ourselves or about others. But a fixed mindset is part of being human. We all experience that. Uh, it's normal. And so let's take a moment to think about what is one ability I tend to see as fixed, which may be limiting me or others, whether in your personal life or in your professional life. Creativity, the ability to take risks, working with difficult people, the ability to work with difficult people, the ability to change habits, especially old habits, athleticism, intelligence, the ability to cope with change, 
the ability to manage time, discipline, confidence, kindness, emotional intelligence. Great. So this is wonderful. Hopefully we're increasing our self-awareness, which is a, a step in this process, right? And, and, and we need to think about, is, is this true, right? Like, for example, discipline, is that something that's fixing people or is that something that can be developed? You know, what does the science say about this? Are there books written about how to increase discipline? Are there, you know, videos or TED Talks about it? That's something that we can research, right? If we think that discipline is important to us and we have a fixed mindset about it, then we can ask the question, is that assumption true? Or is that assumption something that's getting in the way of my goals, empathy, et cetera? Okay, great. Um, so a growth mindset has lots of benefits uh, and it's very powerful. So what can we do about it? What can we do to foster a growth mindset and to act upon it? So three things that we can do is first, think about how we frame things for ourselves and for our children, right? Meaning, how is it that we explain what we do on a daily basis? And it's part of what we do on a daily basis, work to change ourselves and to learn, right? And to develop ourselves. Uh, second, what systems and habits do we use to do that? What are the what are, habits are we using in order to learn and to change ourselves? And finally, are we modeling learning visibly in front of others, like in front of our children? And we'll examine each of these three things, but I want to first share a second framework with you, which helps us do these three things at the same time. And so I'm going to step out of our context, look at a, a group of people who are fantastic at what they do and think about how they become so good at what they do uh, so that we can generate some insights and then we'll bring it back to our context and think about what can we take from this? What can we do about it? So this group of people who are fantastic at what they do is Cirque du Soleil. I love to watch them perform. They do these incredible acrobatic things and they do them beautifully and artistically. But something that we often, like something that creates a little bit of a, of a conflict for me is that they very rarely make mistakes. Uh, and, and I'm saying here that in a growth mindset, we need to challenge ourselves, make mistakes, learn from those mistakes. So how can I say that? And at the same time, admire the level of excellence of Cirque du Soleil. But we, what we sometimes don't have top of mind is that the reason Cirque du Soleil is so good at what they do is that they spend a lot of time doing something very different from what we see on stage. When they're behind curtain at the gym or at the studio, they are missing the ball a lot. They're dropping the ball. They're missing the timing a lot because they're focused on what they haven't mastered yet, right? And so they're working on what we call the learning zone here on the left. And that's what enables them to perform so well on the performance zone on the right. Um, same thing in sports, right? If we're playing a championship final and we're having trouble with a particular move, we're going to avoid that move if we can in that match. But then after the match, we're going to go to our coach and say, coach, I was having trouble with this move. Let's work on that. And that's a very different activity. It's a very different area of focus than what we do during the performance, during the match. And what often happens in work and in life is that we are always in the performance zone, right? We're in chronic performance, just trying to get things done as best as we can, trying to minimize mistakes, and that leads to stagnation. So uh, Roger Federer was once being interviewed by a reporter, and he said, December was crucial for me. I don't want to say this in a cocky way, but I believe I worked the hardest from the top eight players in the offseason. Many guys went off to play exhibitions or were in the Davis Cup. I had time, I put my head down and worked. So he's not saying that these people who were playing games, you know, they were working really hard too. They were trying to win those games, but he's saying that the effort to perform in a game is very different than the effort to improve. And he was focused on improvement, right? Uh, so the people who become fantastic at what they do, they engage in both of these two zones. They alternate between the two, they integrate them. And the key is that in order to improve, we must be deliberate about improvement. Improvement doesn't happen just from hard work because there's two different types of hard work, hard work to perform and hard work to improve. And so in the learning zone, our goal is to get better versus in the performance zone is to perform and get something done. Uh, in the learning zone, we focus on what we don't know and therefore we have to expect to make mistakes versus in the performance zone, we focus on what we have already mastered. We're trying to avoid mistakes. And no matter what mistake we make in each of the zones, we want to respond in a learning oriented way and think about what can I learn from this mistake? What can I do differently going forward? And a growth mindset helps us in both of these zones. So what often happens in work and life is that we're so busy just trying to get the work done or trying to get done whatever we want to do 
that we just try to do it as best as we can, doing what we know and trying to minimize mistakes. And that leads to stagnation. We don't get better over time as a result of that. Um, now, the reality is a little bit more complicated. The reality is that when we're novices, when we don't know how to do something at all, if we just try to do the activity, we will get better because we're so bad that we don't need great learning strategies in order to get better. Like if we're trying to um, learn how to play basketball and we've never played basketball before, if we just play a few games, we're going to get better or golf or whatever it is, right? But then what happens is that we, we stagnate. We, we keep playing games and we don't get better. And then we tend to conclude, oh, this is I can't get any better, right? But the issue is really that we're not going about it in an effective way. Um, so when I asked you earlier, if I could get better at anything, what would I improve? Whatever you wrote down, I want you to think about, do you regularly engage in the learning zone with regards to that? Because if, if you don't engage in the learning zone, we're, you're not gonna get better just by magic, right? Um, so I'm gonna bring it back to our context and show you a few of the learning zone activities that any of us can engage in. And I want you to think about, are there one or two of these that you could be doing better or more regularly? I'll give you a moment to think about that. Are there one of, or two of these that you could be doing better or more regularly? I encourage you to write down your insights that you come through so that you can review them later because new insights are weak connections in the brain and we tend to forget them. We tend to think we'll remember them, but we tend to forget them unless we come back to them, right? Great. So question, to what extent do I engage in the learning zone in your life? Uh, what is true for you? Okay, so we see about 60% of you feel I could significantly improve in my engagement in the learning zone. That's exciting to me. Hopefully we're generating some insight here that we can act upon. 30%, uh, I'm pretty good when it comes to the learning zone, but I couldn't improve further. About 11% of you, I feel really good about how I'm engaging the learning zone. Whatever the answer is for you is great. I do, I'm excited that a lot of you are seeing an opportunity for improvement. That's a very growth-minded perspective. Um, and I also want you to notice that as of now, it seems like nobody has chosen that last option. And that's important to note because the learning zone is something that resonates with people. You know, if you, I mean, I, most of my work is with, with businesses. I, I do training for leaders and for professionals around this. And whatever your context is, when you bring up these topics with your colleagues, uh, you'll find that they resonate. And the, the exciting part about that is that then you can engage in collaborative learning with one another. And that's a lot more effective because we learn better when we're doing it collaboratively than when we're doing it on our own. And it helps us build a learning culture that way. So notice that this resonates and you can engage the people around you in learning together. Um, so in order to engage in the learning zone, we are working on what we haven't mastered yet. We have to expect to make mistakes. So that means that we, in order to engage in the learning zone, we have to be in a low stake situation, meaning the consequence of mistakes must not be very material. So as an analogy, a, a Cirque du Soleil tight rope walker is not going to try new skills without a net underneath because they're gonna fall and they're gonna get hurt. And often the way we feel or the way students feel or children feel, uh, is more like this, right? Like if we make mistakes, negative consequences are going to happen, you know? Uh, for us adults, sometimes, and even for children also, sometimes that negative consequence is that we think that other people will think less of us, right? That if we, if we never make mistakes, people are gonna think more highly of us. And if we make mistakes, then people are going to be disappointed. And if that's what we're thinking, then we're always going to be in the performance zone, right? Because we want, to, we want other people to think highly of us. So we need a culture and an environment where we're, we're encouraging one another to, to experiment, to take on challenges, to, to work on ourselves, 
uh, and to grow. And that's what's valued, right? Uh, so that that's actually what increases people's social status is to take those risks to experiment um, and to try new things. And so one way to create this, this safety is to, th to think about creating safety islands. Like what are the times and spaces where we want people to take risk? Like, you know, in sports, it would be practice, right? In practice, we want to try new things, things that may or may not work. And then during the match, if it's high stakes, then that's the performance zone. And that differentiation between those two things then creates the safety for practice, for the learning zone. Same thing, we can do lots of things in the workplace or in our families or at school, there's the high stakes test versus the rest of the time. You know, often students are thinking about all of school as a high stakes thing where they need to be getting 108 pluses in everything they do. That means if they see school as a performance zone all the time, they're, go they're never gonna be taking risks. They're going to try to be pretending that they know everything and they're not gonna learn very much, right? Um, and so another way that we can think about creating safety is just by creating safe waters in the sense that we're all human. We all make mistakes, even in the performance zone. So when that happens, can we just feel safe to talk about that with each other? Hey, you know, this didn't go as planned. You know, what can I learn from this? What can we learn from this? What can we do differently going forward? And a way to create that safety is to think about how you frame things for yourself and for the people around you, including your children, using ideas like growth mindset, right? Like performance zone, like learning zone. How do we explain what life is about, what school is about, what work is about, what it is that we do on a daily basis? And it's part of that working to change and develop ourselves. Second, what systems and habits are we using to do that, to improve? What does the learning zone look like for us? Is it soliciting feedback? Is it experimenting, right? Is it reading? Is it going to online courses? Is it having the type of conversations that we have around the dinner table? Are we sharing with our families uh, ideas that we're learning or asking them questions that we can learn from? And finally, are we modeling learning ourselves? Not just talking about the importance of learning, but are we showing our process? Because through your actions, other people learn whether abilities are malleable, whether you believe that people can change, whether you think that's important and how we go about it. Uh, so we need to not just do our learning in private on our own, but we need to make it visible to our families and to our colleagues, right? Um, and so when I asked you earlier, how do I want my children to perceive me and to think of me? You wrote wonderful things uh, like being a supportive and guiding parent, that I'm a loving parent, as a pillar of strength, supportive of their goals, kind, these are wonderful things and your your children resilient your children are very very lucky to have you and i don't want you to remove these things but if you don't have top of mind that you want to be perceived as a lifelong learner in front of your students uh, or your children i want you to consider adding that right because if if you're not trying to be perceived as a work in progress as someone who is always continuing to learn and improve further then it's going to be hard for them to develop as lifelong learners as well um, so think about to what extent do you do these things to model being a learner and are there one or two things that you could be doing more regularly or better i'll give you a moment to think about that And very quickly, I'm just going to share one more study with you that uh, is specific to parenting. There's lots of studies on parenting, um, and and then we're gonna I'm going to share one more thought, and we're going to uh, open up a Q and A. Um, so in in this particular study, uh, the researchers Carol Dweck and and Kyla Hamovitz um, examine how parents viewed failure whether they saw it as something that's enhancing, as an opportunity to learn and get better and increase competence, or as something that's debilitating, as a sign of weakness and something to be avoided. And what they found is that this different view of failure that parents had led to the different mindset of their children. You know, whether the people who saw, the parents who saw failures as enhancing had children who developed a growth mindset, um, and those who saw failure debilitating tended to have children who de developed more of a fixed mindset. And then later that, that showed in the grades in school, the students in a, in a growth mindset had higher grades than those in a fixed mindset. Um, and so one thing that happens is that 
when we see failure as enhancing as part of the learning process, something we want to be doing, right? We want to fail in the sense that we want to be doing things we haven't done before that could really stretch us and we can learn from. That means that we're we're going to fail a lot. We're going to not do those things well all the time. And that failure is going to be very useful information for us to figure out what to tweak, what to change, so that then we can develop those skills, right? And so they focus, this, these parents focus on the children's learning and they want their children to take on challenges to do things that they don't know how to do well yet. Um, and they're supportive of that versus the, the, the parents who see failure as debilitating tend to just focus on the children's performance and their ability. So they might get very uncomfortable if their children get a B or a C or if they don't do well in a game, right? Um, and, 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 and so they're, they're hoping that their children are always doing everything perfectly and that tends to foster a fixed mindset in their children. Uh, so think about, so part of this work is for us to think about how do we think about failure? How do we think about feedback? Are we comfortable with risk? and work on our own ideas of what these things may, mean so that then we can be in a learning oriented way throughout our whole life. Uh, so one more thought before um, opening it to Q&A. Uh, these are five things that I think are most important for uh, children to be motivated and effective learners. The first one is growth mindset. We've talked about that. The second one is learning strategies and habits. We've talked about that. Like for example, the learning zone and the performance zone. What does the learning zone look like? I want to share three other things with you. One is learning community. The people around us affect us so much, right? And so if we are in a workplace where everybody's learning, everybody's soliciting feedback, everybody's talking about mistakes, everybody's experimenting, we are going to learn a lot more and we're going to be feeling a lot more confident and comfortable doing those things than if we're in a workplace where everybody you know, is trying to like appear as flawless. The same thing is true for kids, right? So think about the relationships that kids have and how we can foster communities that learn together and that model learning together. And the same thing is true in our families. Like when we when we go home from work and are having a dinner conversation, are we sharing kind of what struggles we're experiencing at work and or whatever, you know, wherever we are and what what we are what we're trying and the feedback that we received and the mistakes we've made and what we're learning from those mistakes that's a community at home that we're building that's a learning community also think about purpose right we engage in the performance zone and in the learning zone for a purpose you know when we are when we have a connection with something that we care about, something we want to contribute to the world and to the people around us, then we're a lot more motivated to engage in both of those zones, uh, the learning zone and the performance zone. And a way to cultivate this is just to help people, help children explore their interests, right? Expose them to new things and, and see, you know, find something that, that, that they can drive, you know, because they're interested in it, right? And especially if they, if they can find something that they want to contribute to other people. And, and children also need to meet their basic needs like food and shelter, but also safety, right? A sense of physical safety, emotional safety. And without that, it's hard for the things at the top to take place in a strong way. Uh, and so we want children to develop these things so that they become strong, lifelong learners. Uh, that also means that we need to develop these things in ourselves in order to become life, strong lifelong learners ourselves and to model that for our children as well. So with that, let's open it up for a Q&A. We're gonna use the same polling system that we've used before. So what questions do I have for Eduardo or insights I'd like to share? Submit any questions, but also submit any insights you've had because when we write our insights, we strengthen our connections in our brain. We're a lot more likely to remember those insights later. And then we also better learn from one another. I learn from you and we learn from each other when we're sharing our insights. So submit your questions and insights. And I'm gonna invite Charlene to join me here so that we can have a conversation guided by your questions. And as you'll see here, it, when you can also upvote this question. So you can go into your app and see what other people have submitted. And so when something resonates with you, you want me to address that question, just upvote it, click on the up arrow, and that's going to bring it up to the top. And those are the things that we're going to be talking about. So you'll see that people here are upvoting what are other tools we, the parent, can use for learning growth mindset. Great, so I'll just uh, invite uh, Charlene uh, right here to have a conversation with me guided by your questions. All right, Eduardo, it looks like people want to hear about some other tools. So where are right. other 
resources or places people can find information about how to share growth mindset with their kids? Great. So the number one tool, in my opinion, is the source. Is a seminal book on it is the book Mindset by Carol Dweck is the book that put growth mindset on the map. It describes all of the research around growth mindset. It, it describes strategies. There's there's whole chapter devoted to parenting. Um, so uh, definitely uh, the book Mindset by Carol Dweck is a great resource on this. Um, another great resource is uh, the website perts.net, P-E-R-T-S dot net. And there's sections on that for parents. Another website is the, the company that I co-founded with Carol Dweck it's called mindsetworks.com. There's resources for parents there as well, as well as, as, well as schools and, and, and educators. Um, but those are probably the, the, the best resources out there. There's lots of other books, lots of other videos online. But those, those are trusted sources because as we saw at the beginning and as you might have experienced, um, when we think about what growth mindset is, we might come up with things like perseverance or open-minded. And so it's something that's really easy to distort. And so there's also people writing about growth mindset that are a little confused on it. So, so there are some sources that are not great in order to learn about it. Um, so go to the sources, but those are great places to start. And there's also lots of great resources as well. Thank you, Eduardo. And uh, parents, I highly recommend that book, Mindset by Carol Dweck. It is not an academic reading book. It's really easy to read and just filled full of great tips. Okay, here is a question people want to hear about. How can I motivate my child to challenge him or herself? Great. Um, so I so 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 once when we're in a growth mindset and we believe that we can change ourselves and develop ourselves. That's, that's a necessary condition to take on challenges, but it's not a sufficient condition. So what are the things that, so if, so if let's, let's first like put our children aside for a second, let's think about any person, ourselves or our children, right? What does a person need to do in order to challenge ourselves, uh, especially with something that we can learn from? First, the first thing we need is to believe that we can improve, that we can develop. So we need to develop a growth mindset in our children. Um, uh, the, probably the most effective way to do that um, is to examine how to improve effective learning strategies like the learning zone and the performance zone, right? So for them to be learning about how to improve, what the learning zone look like, to be developing habits in the learning zone. And that's something that I think we, we can do with them together. Like we can't just have them do it. We have to do it too and do it together and model it. Uh, as we as we saw, so I would ask, you know, it, for first, like I would ask yourself, am I in a growth mindset? Do I believe that intelligence can be developed and that abilities can be developed? Uh, do I feel like failure is enhancing? That failure is something that can make us stronger. Do I feel like feedback is really useful? Am I soliciting feedback from people all the time? Am I talking about what I'm looking to improve? Am I sharing that with my children and with my colleagues? If you're not doing those things, then I would encourage you to start there because it's going to be hard for you to influence your child if you are having embedded this in yourself and really embodied it. Um, if you are there, if you're if you're doing those things, um, then modeling that and helping your child, guiding them to become like you, right? And so you'll know like how to do this because you do it all the time. And so growth mindset, learning strategies, then finding ways to get around a learning community, right? So if you if your child is interested in learning drawing, right? Uh, is there a community of people who love to, to draw and who are interested in becoming great artists? Like, can you, can you, can you get a community around your child so that they can support each other and coach each other and give feedback to each other to become great artists, right? And to take on challenges. And if, if they're very comfortable with crayons, you know, to take on challenges with, you know, whatever it is, oil, oil painting. Um, a sense of purpose. So this is, uh, is your child interested in, in something that not, they, we want them to take, I mean, it's going to be really hard for them to, to challenge themselves with things that they're not interested in, right? And a lot of the things in school sometimes are things that are not interesting or relevant, like, you know, and so we need to 
find in ourselves our ability to ignite, you know, to, to, to help our children explore the world and, and what they could pursue in the world so that they develop their own interests. Uh, and that's part of it, right? We want them to find something that challenges because they want to take on the challenge because they really care about this cause. And obviously there, there's the basic needs of making sure that they have the safety that they know they're going to, if they're going to take challenges and risks, they need to know, they need to have that safety net below them, right? Um, and so, for example, I was speaking with a friend of mine who's a parent um, and he was saying, you know, my daughter and, and my daughter doesn't take risks. Uh, my daughter you know, is afraid of doing things that she hasn't done before. And I try to encourage her to take risks, you know, and, and I'm very puzzled because I and my wife and they're good friends. So we know that they like extreme sports. They do like this, you know, high speed skiing and they do heli skiing and they do all kinds of surfing and all kinds of things. So like, if we take all these risks, how come our daughter doesn't, you know, when she takes a risk, she usually does it well. And I say, you see, you were able to do it well, right? So you, you can take risks, you'll do things well. And, and, and in a conversation, he realized, oh, you know, actually like what he was praising was when she succeeded, right? She was taking the risk and it worked out. She was able to do it. And so the reason she was afraid is that she was afraid of taking a real risk because if she wasn't able to do it, she was afraid to disappoint her dad or her mom, right? Um, and so what, what we need to praise and what we need to value is the actual risk, whether we do it well or not, right? Wow, you know, I'm very proud that you tried something new. You didn't know if it was going to work or not. It didn't work. That's fine. So what are we going to learn from it? What did you learn from this not working? And what are you going to change as a result of that so you can get better? Right. Um, and so what we value in our in, authentically in ourselves, how we communicate that to children is is part of uh, the way to develop a love of challenge in our children. Such a good point, Eduardo. We parents, families need to be the safe waters or the safety net for our kids. So, Eduardo, it looks like maybe we have time for one more question. Yeah. All right. A lot of people wanted to know what can we as parents do to model growth mindset for our kids? Yeah. Um, so, and then we can combine it with the next question. Is there a daily practice yeah. you can do with your parents to reinforce a growth mindset? Um, so first, you know, I, I, I would say to model a growth mindset, we need to be working on continuing to improve ourselves and to change ourselves and to develop ourselves as lifelong learners. Uh, for me personally, the most powerful habit or strategy that I find for myself is to remind myself every morning of what it is that I'm working to improve. I do the same thing every morning. I open up the computer. I Before I check email or anything else, I open up a document and I do several things there. One of those things is review what I'm working, what new habit I'm working to form in myself. And so I do that every day. So it's really easy. It's very automatic. And then it reminds me what I want to put effort into building, into, into changing in myself. And then that ensures that I'm always working on changing something in myself. So that ensures that I'm going to be a lifelong learner, right? So in modeling that, we need to engage to make that visible to our children. So are we sharing with them what we're working to improve in ourselves, what we're working to get better at? So that's number one. Two, how are we going about it? Like if we want to get better uh, tennis, you know, yeah, am I working with a coach? Am I reading, you know, a book about it or watching videos or, you know, am I, am I engaging in like deliberate practice to work on my top spin serve? And am I talking about it and what I'm finding challenging? Or am I talking about what feedback I received at work and what was surprising about that for me and what I learned and what I'm going to change as a result? So those are some ways to model being a learner, to being interested in continuing to grow myself as an adult and sharing my process with my children. Um, so I'm gonna share a couple of key takeaways from our time together. The first one is the most important. And thank you, uh, Charlene, uh, for, for uh, the conversation. The first key takeaway is the most important and that's what you're taking away. So let's take a moment to think about what was the most valuable insight or takeaway for me? Let's share it with each other so we can learn from one another. We can change through deliberate effort. 
And that effort is different than the performance effort. Fear, the role of fear, absolutely. You know, there's research that shows that people who are fearful of snakes can actually change uh, that fear and they can become not fearful of snakes. The same thing with fear of feedback, fear of challenge. We can work with that to change the way we think about those things. Understanding fixed mindset. People can change certain traits, be a role model. The, the role of a safe space to fail. Change is going to always continue. It's part of the universe. Praise the risk, not the outcome. So important. Learning versus performing. The role of anxiety. Great. Thank you for sharing this. A couple of things I would highlight. First, when we ask people what a growth mindset is, we hear lots of things. But a growth mindset is something specific, is the belief that our human abilities or qualities are malleable or changeable. And if you want to learn more about this, as I mentioned before, the book Mindset by Carol Dweck is a great resource. Second, we made a distinction between the learning zone and the performance zone. And the key here is that in order to improve, we must be deliberate about improvement. And finally, three things that we can do is think about how we frame things for ourselves and for other people, including our children. What, setting up systems and habits for performance, but also for improvement and modeling learning visibly in front of others. So a couple of questions to end first, think about what you will do and when. When we identify what we'll do, one thing we'll do and when we'll do it, we're a lot more likely to follow through. So what will you do and when will you do it? Talk daily about a success or a failure and what I'm learning about that. That's great. Read the books starting tonight while it's fresh. Awesome. Catch my mistake. Think about the mistake and acknowledge that I'm growing. And often, sometimes people in a growth mindset or you know, they, who want to foster a growth mindset, they say mistakes are are great and we want mistakes here. And then they kind of, when mistakes happen, they just kind of brush them aside and move on. We need to reflect on mistakes in order to learn from them. We don't learn from mistakes. We learn from reflecting on mistakes as, as this person shared. Great. Have discussions with my kids about my mistakes and what I've learned. Awesome. I will work on overcoming my belief that I'm too old to change. I'll start tomorrow. Awesome. Reflect during breakfast. Awesome. Identify a trait to improve and practice that daily. Awesome. Tomorrow, I will ask my students about what they want to get better at. Great. And then support their process. Help them think about how they get better, right? What learning zone strategies are they going to use? Awesome. So finally, I'm going to ask for a favor. And that's to support my learning zone, I'm going to ask you for your feedback. So I'm going to ask you two questions. One is how well this session worked for you so that I have a sense. And then second is what can I improve and what, what was helpful and what can I improve? So here's the first question. How likely is it that I would recommend a similar session by Eduardo to a friend or a colleague? Uh, so this helps me understand whether this was a good use of your time, right? And whether this was helpful to you. And it helps me kind of calibrate the next question, right? Which is information about how I can get better. Great. So for the most part, it looks like 63% and another 20%. So like over 80% was good use of your time. That's great because I know you're busy, right? As you said at the beginning. Um, so what was most valuable for me and what suggestions for improvement do I have? So what, was there something particularly valuable that's helpful information? And also what can I do better in the future uh, in a similar session for parents? Slower delivery, thank you very much for that. More day-to-day -day examples, thank you. Going in depth on an example, great. Allow parents to talk and directly ask questions. Somebody um, appreciated the polling pool tool, that's helpful to know. 
doing multiple sessions. Great. Keep this feedback coming. I definitely review it and learn from it. So thank you for sharing your feedback. And I'll leave you with three questions. Um, the first one is what insights have I generated? We tend to think that we're going to remember more than we actually remember. So think about what insights are you taking away and write them down, come back to them tomorrow and next week. Second, what will I do when? Identify that, write it down. Uh, and finally, who will I and we become? In a growth mindset, we never stop becoming. We're always continuing to evolve. If you want more resources on mindset, Another resource is my website is brisenio.com slash resources. There's a couple of worksheets there that help you reflect about this. Um, and with that, I will turn it back to Charlene, uh, but thank you for being here today. I hope this has been helpful and thank you for what you do for your children and for the community. Thank you so much for that, Eduardo Brisenio. I can tell that we were all in the learning zone tonight and I hope you all found it as valuable as we did. Again, special thanks to Allison Lanier, Associate Superintendent, and our sponsor, Steve, tonight and the Cupertino Union School District. Thank you so much, Eduardo. Take care, everybody. And we hope to see you again soon. Good night.